For those of you who went to Sunday school as children, did you have to memorize the Beatitudes? Now, where I went to Sunday school as a little girl, we certainly did. Now, one of the other girls, the youngest in my Sunday school class, she was really cute, had freckles all over the place, carroty red hair. She couldn't quite manage to say the word beatitude. And so she called them beautitudes instead. And you know, I think as an adult that she may have been onto something. The Beatitudes, they really are beautiful attitudes for us to have, beautiful ways to live following Jesus's examples and teaching. And they are, of course, just the beginning of Jesus's greatest teaching message, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, although we've got that sermon written down and we could just read it if we wanted to, I think like, like most great sermons by great preachers, you lose a little just reading it all on your own. So let me set the scene for us so that we can imagine ourselves in that crowd, that congregation that first heard Jesus preach. And this will be very different because I want you to picture a whole lot of people all close together of every sort, men, women, children, all occupations and vocations, the, rich, the richest people, the poorest people, and everyone in between, slave and free, people who had followed Jesus from place to place as he traveled. And now, perhaps on a gorgeous morning like today, on a ridge of hills northwest of town, with a magnificent view out over the water, Jesus sat down and he opens his sermon with this beautiful, simple set of sayings. Now, anyone who makes speeches will tell you that to make sure that everyone listens and takes in what you're saying, you need a hook to pull them in. Maybe a story or a provocative question or something that, that catches on their experiences, that makes it feel like even though there's a thousand people there, you are speaking just to them. And that is what Jesus does. He speaks eight blessings to this crowd. Now the temptation is to see the Beatitudes as cause and effect statements. If you are poor, then you will be blessed. And that, that might indeed hook people in, but how comforted would someone who is grieving be by that statement? You are grieving now, but you'll be blessed. Remember that Jesus is speaking to real people. And what he's doing with these opening statements is putting into words that tension that exists between having faith from trusting in God, but still facing actual pain and poverty and all manner of brokenness. What Jesus is doing is describing what is true about their lives, making each one of them, each one of us, feel like he is speaking right to us and answering the broken and frustrated parts of us with the hope and blessing offered by the kingdom of God. So blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you're poor in spirit, then you've lost all your illusions about life for a time. The poor in spirit are demoralized, dejected. In the eyes of the world, they are the lowest of the low because they've been knocked down so many times or so hard that they can't get themselves back up again. But poverty of the spirit makes us realize like nothing else could that we have no refuge but God and we don't need any other refuge but God either. And that is wealth of the spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I don't know if you've noticed in the Bible, but there's, there's no stoicism or stiff upper lip to be found when it comes to Jesus. Jesus never lacked emotion. He wept openly at the death of his friend. Among his final words was a request for someone to please look after his mother. And here Jesus tells us two true things. We will mourn and we will be comforted. We are not told to, to bury our grief or to learn a lesson from loss. We are simply promised that when we grieve, we will do so and in the compassionate and comforting embrace 
of the God who, if you remember last week, who dreams of the day when he will wipe every tear from our eyes. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, although it rhymes, the meek are not the weak, and they are certainly not the mousy. To be truly meek, gentle to all, willing to put God and other people ahead of yourselves, that takes great strength and tremendous sacrifice. And trusting in God's plan and following Jesus, that could never be a sign that we are weak. But we live in a world that tells us otherwise and distracts us from our true inheritance. At every turn, we're told to make our happiness happen now, on our own terms, without any thought of other people. But we are children of God, and here Jesus promises us that our happiness and our inheritance are already secure. Now this is one of my favorite Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now righteousness and its, its frequent friend, justice, these are old, old words that God taught to us. And when we hear the word justice, we might think of a, a criminal getting the punishment he deserves. But in the ancient language of God's people, justice means something more like fairness and equity. And when we hear righteousness, we might think, well, somebody is being self-righteous. But what it means is living in right relationship. Righteousness is how we live out justice. So hungering and thirsting for righteousness, that is a need that we share with Jesus himself. And that need will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, mercy does not fare any better today than it did in the Roman province of Judea 2,000 years ago. We live in a time of punishment, and mercy is giving someone what they don't deserve. But mercy is not the absence of justice. It's simply the presence of forgiveness. And because of Jesus, God has no punishment left for us. God is not standing ready with a long list of all our failures to explain why the mercy we thought we received didn't actually count. Jesus saved us and made us right with God. It is final and it is finished. And so Jesus can then say, and we can happily hear, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's not an impossible standard for us anymore. Because as is so often true when it comes to Jesus, he has already done the hard work. We need only accept the gift of mercy, and we can anticipate seeing God with joy. And now we come nearly to the end. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now as nice as a, a serene and peaceful feeling can be, we know that our emotional states really don't last. We need a peace with substance and strength and staying power. We need the peace that comes from wholeness, from that right relationship between us and God. But we won't be able to make peace until the peace that Jesus made remakes us. And in seeking peace, we are blessed, and so is the world around us. But not everyone will respond well to our peacemaking. So Jesus offers us assurance and comfort. Blessed are the persecuted and those who are reviled and lied about for my sake, for theirs is the kingdom. And when the world offers us indifference or even just hostility, the truth of this final beatitude is that there is no suffering so great that Jesus cannot heal it. And there is no difficulty or pain so trivial that his heart does not bear it with us. It would be unhealthy to be thankful when we But Jesus teaches us that we can find blessing in the certainty that we are not alone in those moments. So that's a pretty incredible hook to get everyone paying attention and wanting to hear more. Like that long ago crowd of real ordinary people, I suspect that each of us found our own experiences and our own truths spoken to by Jesus here as well. The Beatitudes offer comfort amidst the difficulties we face. They speak into our experiences and the hard things of our life and insist on promising hope. 
But when we read the verses that follow the Beatitudes, we see that we are not meant to simply just know them. There's a powerful hint from Jesus that the message he is speaking is for more than just our comfort. According to Matthew, this is what Jesus said next in chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. We are called to be salt in a world without flavor. Shining cities on hills, lamps uncovered and unobscured. We are not meant to only take personal comfort from these Beatitudes or simply to know them in our memory. We are meant to proclaim them. This message must be spoken and shared and lived in real, tangible ways. And I wonder sometimes if we've lost sight of what an, an upside-down, countercultural view of the world these Beatitudes really do offer us. If the, the salt of Jesus' message has lost a little of its saltiness because of long familiarity. Because of the Sermon on the Mount, even just this opening address of the Beatitudes, this is the message that got Jesus killed. It's the message that landed his disciples in prison and worse. It's the message that scared and disgusted empires, both ancient and modern, it's the message that continues to confuse both Christians and non-believers today. And scaling it down to bookmarks and memory verses and even t-shirts and wall plaques, well, that seems a little like fear too, really, doesn't it? Or at least an attempt to, to tame something wild and world-changing, since this is, more than anything else, the manifesto of a gentle revolution. Now, you may be thinking that I am exaggerating for dramatic effect, but imagine a world, your world, your ordinary day-to-day -day comings and goings. Imagine if these beautiful attitudes were everyone's basis for action, if they were the guiding principles by which everyone, men, women, and children, all occupations and vocations, rich and poor and everyone in between, slave and free, if these beautiful attitudes were how all of those people lived their lives. It would indeed be a revolutionary new society, a new kingdom come. Now, no matter how comfortable we manage to make our lives here, we'll never feel fully at home in this world because we were made for the coming one. But while we're here, Jesus, never more clearly, has given us a job to do, to be messengers, people who share these revolutionary teachings by our every action, our every thought, and our every word, to be salt for bland imaginations, welcoming lit-up cities on dark hilltops, lamps that illuminate every corner of this awfully dark world. The kingdom is Christ's. We are his messengers, and all are welcome. Thanks be to God. Amen.